morning. It is Father's Day, so happy Father's Day to everybody. And uh, because it is Father's Day, there's nothing better on Father's Day than dad jokes, right? Dad jokes are awesome. So just for those in the room that just can't wait to hear some good dad jokes, we're going to start off with that. So a couple questions and let's see if you can get some answers. Do you know who the smallest person in the Bible was? Nehemiah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Do you know why, jo why, why Jonah couldn't trust the ocean? Because he knew there was something fishy about it. <laughs> okay, ladies, this one's for you. Who was the most business savvy woman in the, in the entire Bible? Come on, time's ticking. The most business savvy woman in the entire Bible. Well, in case you're wondering, it was Pharaoh's daughter. She went down to the bank of the Nile and she pulled out a little prophet. <laughs> <laughs> Another one for the ladies. Do you know what kind of person Boaz was before he got married? Single. Ruthless. Uh. <laughs> um, and what time of day was Adam created? A little before Eve. <laughs> did Eve ever have a date with Adam? You ever thought about that? Genesis, did Eve ever have a date with Adam? Nope, just an apple. <laughs> and you know what the difference is between Jesus and pizza? Jesus can't be topped. <laughs> Those are the dad jokes for the day. That was it. That's as bad as it gets. You can stop moaning now. So, um, gotta have dad jokes on Father's Day, right? So, if you want to turn with me, we are in Luke 15 uh, today. As uh, this is, there's three parables in Luke 15, and we're going to look at the third one this morning. One of the the favorite parables of most people because they can relate with this parable, and it's a great parable for us because it's it's the parable that's called the prodigal son. Most of you have probably heard it in multiple sermons on it throughout your life. But it's about the prodigal son, and it's, it's a story of a father's love for his son. And uh, we, we saw in the videos today, there are many fathers. There are absent fathers we're praying for to reunite with their children. There are fathers that have passed on. There are older fathers, younger fathers. There are, in essence, stepfathers. There are mentors who act as fathers to help children. There are all kinds of fathers. But this story is about a father waiting, waiting for his wayward son, and the story is really about the love of the Father. What I hope you can hear today in the message on this Father's Day is we have a heavenly Father, right? Our Father in heaven um, that watches over us. And what the Father in this story really exemplifies is our Father in heaven's love for us. Now, the one common denominator that we all have is we have this heavenly Father. And so uh, some of us have had good earthly fathers, some of us have not some of us have had absent fathers or stepfathers and all those other folks those mentors and everything but the message today about this father is the heavenly father's outlook for you and me because there are those times like the the prodigal son that we tend to go a little wayward right whether it's a little sin or a lot of sin whether it's a day an hour a week a decade we like the son in this story, do tend to go wayward, and our Father in heaven waits for us with love and care and anticipates the time that we can be back in relationship with him. So that's the big picture. So if uh, you're short on time today, you can go home now. You just kind of heard the whole sermon. If you want to stick around for the rest of it, you can kind of hear it as the pieces are filled in. So uh, the story of the prodigal son, William Barclay, a uh, theologian and pastor, states this as he is a commentator on Luke 15. He says, for centuries, this third parable has been called the parable of the prodigal son. It would be far better if it were called the parable of the loving father, for it is the father and not the son who is truly the hero of this story, right? And those of you that have read the story or heard the story know that's true. The father is really the hero. We have this this uh, dynamic between a wayward son and what his life goes through. We have another aspect of the story, which we'll talk about at another time in another sermon, about the older son who stays with the father, but at the end of the story ends up being jealous of how the younger son is treated. But then the thing that holds it all together is the father, the loving father and his relationship with both sons. Uh, in the play, the, Vincent, the, Vince, the Merchant of Venice, 
William Shakespeare says, is a wise father that knows his son. And we celebrate on Father's Day that um, we hope that everyone has had a father that is invested in our lives. We hope that uh, we as men or mentors, that we invest our lives and our children, that we have this relationship with our children and with our fathers. And as we piggyback off of that, it comes back to a spiritual point for everyone in this room in, in that we want to have a relationship, a good, building, growing, exchanging relationship with our Father in Heaven. That as we know our Father in Heaven knows us so intently and dearly, in fact, better than we know ourselves, we look forward to that time with Him. The interesting thing in the story here with the prodigal son is that the son takes off, we know that part, but the father knows his son so well that he never gives up on him. In fact, day to day to day, he continues to look out for his son, his wayward son, to come home. Now that's really kind of impacting in our world today. Because today, the, the kind of mentality as far as parenthood is like out of sight, out of mind, right? You know, kids are to be seen, not heard, the old mentality that people separate from themselves. They, they bail out on the intended relationships that God has called them to be in. Women not being women and respecting their husbands. Men not honoring their wives and, and failing on their God-given ability and their physical ability to be a father for their child. Kennel prayed for the absent fathers. That's a huge growing issue in our world. And then we see those men that are trying and struggling. And so we come back to the story about the picture of a good father, a good father who knows his sons and never gives up on them at all. Uh, it's important that a father has a good relationship with his children. Uh, because otherwise, children can have this animosity and this distance that leads them into making fatal mistakes throughout their lives because a father figure has not been there. Um, we've come to Luke 15 and we realize this. It's not just a nice, good bedtime story. Do you know that? I mean, it's a nice story to have a bed if you have ki kids or grandkids or Ellen, if you want to go home with Richard while he's sleeping and read this beautiful story with him, I'm sure he'd love it. It is a nice story, but we need to realize a couple other things. When we look in the Bible, we see that it's Jesus that is telling us this story. And I always kind of look at the fact that when Jesus is speaking to us, even more than the apostles or, or the other folks, when Jesus is speaking to us, he is trying to convey a message to us that is life applicable. It's not just a story that he's telling to make us have a, oh, that's a beautiful story, good feeling afterwards. It's a life impacting, a life applicable story that he is speaking to us about our relationship with God the Father. More so than our relationship with our worldly father, our relationship with God the Father, and how important that is and how impacting that is, and even more so when we have failed that we should not be in a point where we're too ashamed to come home because of what we've done or where we've been. That our Father in Heaven is always, always waiting for us. So as we read the story, I hope to encourage you to listen, not just so much for the story, because I'm sure most of you know it, but to listen to the fact of what God is saying to you, what Jesus is speaking to you in the story about your relationship with your Heavenly Father and how to allow that to touch your life, to draw you closer to Him. Let's read. Luke 15, starting with verse 11. I'll be reading out a New American Standard. It says, And he said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So the father decided, divided his wealth between them. And then not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey to a distant land. And there he did what? He squandered his entire estate with loose living. Now, when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in the country, and the son began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him, sent the young son into the fields to feed the pigs. 
And that young son would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one was willing to give him anything. So we stop here for a minute before we dig on, and we see this interesting life event that happens in this relationship with his father and, the, and his two sons. That here's dad living life, just kind of going on normal and enjoying life a little bit, and uh, having his life with his two sons. And the younger son comes up, this young whippersnapper, this young sprout pops up and says, Dad, I want my share of the inheritance now. Well, according to Deuteronomy 21:17, it wasn't uncommon during this time in history where a father would give his sons their inheritance before he died. And the whole reason was this. Again, you're living in an agrarian society, a farming, ranching society, where you may have had land, but you've got animals to take care of, you've got fields to take care of. So a good, wise father during this time in history would divvy his land and his, his livestock up to give to his sons. Why? So they could start maintaining that stuff before he died and dad could actually relax a little bit. Good plan. I like this dad, right? So it wasn't uncommon for that to happen, but what was uncommon in this story is the younger son comes up. He's grown up at his father's house with all the father's providence, with all the father's caring. We know we read in the story later on that the father is wealthy enough to have servants in the house. So the father's got some money, so my understanding is he has taken good care of his children. Well, anyone that's been around kids for a long time realize this, that kids want, like most adults that are just grown up kids, they want one thing. And do you know what that is? What they don't have, right? The, the old grass is greener in the, in the other, on the other side of the fence kind of theory that life must be, must be so much better out there. So I want to take you back a little bit to when you were a child, or if you've got children or grandchildren, those times to remember those points where you were being cared for, you were being provided for, you were, everything is there for you. You know, I read a story uh, this last week about uh, college uh, son that when he showed up at college and there was no bedding or anything in the dorm He was kind of frustrated. He called up his mom. He says mom doesn't the bedding just come with the house Right because he'd been provided for he didn't have another concept But there are those times when we have grown up or our children or grandchildren grow up But although they've been provided for with food and clothing and shelter and school and sports and whatever else and toys and trinkets It's just not good enough and so-and-so has it better. And in fact, I'm gonna take my little pink suitcase and I'm gonna run away from home, right? We've seen that. I remember the boys doing that when they were little and the fun thing was we kind of had enough experience from being in church to realize, gotta go ahead and call their bluff. So we actually offered to help them pack their suitcases, which they were a little held back at. But it's like, if you wanna go see the world, Go do that. And that's kind of what's going on here with this prodigal son and his father. The son's grown up in somewhat affluent lands with his father. And his brother's working and he's working and dad has expectations on them for being part of the household, which is the way it should be. They should be contributing and helping. But the son gets to the point and he's like, you know, dad just tells me what to do. And you know what? I just, this isn't life here. I mean, there's got to be so much more. I hear stories about life out there and all that can be done and, and dad is just so confining with me. I mean, I'm just so limited here. He's, he's kind of one of those goody two shoes, you know, let's go to the synagogue on Sundays and let's worship God and then I got my chores and dad's just limiting me so much. There's, I deserve so much better, right? So in essence, when the son offers to his dad to give him his inheritance now, he's not falling into this category of dad, give me my inheritance so that I can begin taking care of things that you can relax a little bit. What he's literally saying is, Dad, I want you to drop dead and I want what's mine now because I am taking off and leaving. Anybody in here when you were growing up ever threatened to run away from home? You ever did it? Ever thought about it until finally you were 18 you could actually leave and get out of there, you know? We go through these things and so do our children and our children's children. 
that we're in a beautiful, wonderful setting where we're completely cared for one way or another, but it's just not fair and it's just not good enough. I mean, look at my friends, they have this. Look at this, these other people have this. Look at our neighbors. And we think growing up in that provision that there is so much better out there somewhere and we deserve to have it. So we're gonna go get it. So this young prodigal son has an interesting thing happen. The father, who was a wise father, now initially if you're a non-believer and you don't understand the story, you may look at this guy and say, what an idiot. Who would just give up his inheritance to his kids while they're still alive, knowing full well the attitude of this younger son that he's just gonna go out and do what with this? He's gonna blow it. I mean, the dad knows this going into this, right? He knows his son was kind of reckless and didn't care for things at home. And the son's saying, Dad, drop dead and give me my inheritance now. He knows this about his son, but yet he makes this decision to go ahead and give it to his son. Now, in verse 13, it says that the son went off and he invested his inheritance in a two-word lifestyle called loose living. Now in the Greek, that means, those two words mean this, recklessly extravagant, characterized by wasteful expenditure. In other words, what this son does is he takes the inheritance of his dad, he goes into town, he sells it all off, and then he goes out on a free-for-all because suddenly he has money in his pocket and he is just buying and doing everything he can. In fact, he's going beyond that. He's buying and doing everything his dad told him what? Not to do. And why? Because now he can. And he's just living this wild lifestyle. You know, it's like all the pleasure, all the fun, all the sin, no guilt and no consequence, supposedly. I mean, if we've ever been in a place or had someone in the place of this younger son, isn't that what they think? Well, I'm just gonna go out and blow all this money and do all this stuff that my parents wouldn't let me do, and I'm gonna live this wild lifestyle because there's no one to show up and tell me I shouldn't be doing that. There's no one to show up and tell me no. There's no one to say, well, you're doing something wrong. In fact, when I look around, I have all these friends that are enjoying what I'm doing too. I mean, they're partying, they're having fun, we're out late at night, we're having all this fun together and there's no consequence. Well, all of us that have lived life beyond that of a 25 year old know one thing about this kind of lifestyle, don't we? There eventually is a point where the money runs out, the ibuprofen doesn't cover the headaches, the bills start rolling in, and our so-called friends just kind of disappear because we can't provide for them anymore and we're not doing the same things they can anymore because we can't afford it, right? And suddenly now all the consequence that we thought wasn't ever going to happen begins to roll in and it rolls in big and fast. You see, the prodigal son went out and had his life fill of cheap thrills. In fact, it says he took it one step further because he didn't even stay in town to really throw it in, in dad's face. His plan was he sold all this stuff and he went to what? The Bible says is a far country. In other words, he went as far away from his dad as he could. You know, he didn't want to be anywhere in town where dad could just happen to pop in and say, hey son, you need some help? You need me to carry you out and put you in bed this afternoon? Hey son, do you need this? Hey son, do you want me to clean that stuff off your face? Or son, that's really not the kind of girl you want to be with because look at their lifestyle and they're influencing you more than you're influencing them. He went to a distant country somewhere away from his dad so there was no way his dad could show up and be dad and intervene. So it says something about this young man, doesn't it? I mean, even before he blows all the money, it says volumes about his attitude towards his father, doesn't it? His father's provided, his father's done all this stuff, but to this son, it's just not good enough. And he doesn't appreciate what his father has done at all 
The thing is, he doesn't appreciate what he has. You see, contentment in the Bible, whether it's in things, in money, in church, in relationships, contentment in the Bible is truly valuing what? What you already have in your life. Not having to seek out those things that you think will make you so much happier because now you get to do them when you've been told, no, 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 that's not the right thing. Contentment is life is learning what you have and how valuable it is and how much of a blessing it is and appreciating it before you get to the point that you go out and live this life of loose living, squander it all and perhaps lose it all forever. This son is not content with what his father's provided at home, is he? Now, we have always been content with what we've had growing up, right? Our children and grandchildren are always content with what they've been given, right? I have a shameful story that when I was a young boy, I must have been seven, eight years old, maybe younger, but uh, it was my birthday. We were out at this old farmhouse. Both grandparents gave me a gift. It was all nice and wrapped up, and both gifts were two little dump trucks. Well, in my great wise wisdom of six, seven, eight years old, I took one of them out and destroyed it with a rock because I thought, how wrong this is that both sets of grandparents would give me a dump truck. I need a dump truck and something more. And it was about 10 minutes later after I destroyed the one dump truck because that wasn't fair. They should have given me different things so I'd have more stuff that my mom and dad came out and all of a sudden it just hit me what I did the very gift that I had been given half an hour earlier was now completely destroyed in front of me and was useless. It was gone. And there was nobody to blame but who? Me, because I simply didn't appreciate the gift. That's kind of what this son is going through. He's got that attitude that he is not content. He's not happy with what's been provided. He thinks he deserves so much more, and by golly, he's going to go get it, right? Well, the Bible speaks to this. I don't know if you know about it, but back in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2, it says this. Your iniquities, or your sin, your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, that he will not hear you. Well, that's kind of a scary thing to think about, right? That in essence, we have run so far from God that God kind of finally just turns us over to ourselves. You remember the story of King Saul? King Saul kept running from God and doing his own thing and his own thing to the point that God finally said, I'm going to allow you to live with the consequences of your own decisions, Saul. You're going to have to have this horrible life because this is what you're running after. And that's what's going on in this story. Now, interesting, with this being Father's Day and a Father's Day story, showing you the importance of fathers in our life, and especially as Christians, showing us the importance of a good relationship with our Heavenly Father is this. There's the evangelist Bill Glass, and his main ministry as an evangelist is going into the prisons and doing evangelistic ministry and messages and work in these prisons to these men that have been incarcerated and convicted and are there for a couple years or there for life. But the one destructive influence that uh, Bill Glass has found that is a common thread through every single man that he's ministered to is this. They all hate their fathers. That was the one common denominator in their life that made them so destructive was they didn't have a good relationship with their father. In fact, they almost hated their father or their father was absent and never there. That shows us the importance of a father or a father figure in our life, whether it's a worldly father, but especially for us as Christians, a heavenly father. And here's the key, kids. It's never too late to rebuild that relationship, whether it's a worldly relationship or a spiritual relationship with our heavenly father, it's never too late to go back and build that back up and restore it. Because here's the reality. 
when we continue to run away like this prodigal son, it's a downward spiral. Because one thing leads to another, which leads to another, which leads to another, which eventually the bill comes in, right? The invoice comes in and says, oh, by the way, you owe this. And I'm not talking about just a financial bill. I'm talking about an emotional, a relational, a spiritual, a physical bill that comes in. And the reality most often is when that bill comes in, we're not prepared for it as prodigal children and we don't have the means to what? Pay for that bill. And that bill's that. That's for you. That's what's going on. So then we, leave, we see what happens to this young man in verses 15 and 16. He gets to the point that his world crashes down, his make-believe world that he thought was so wonderful, and finally all crashes down, and now he has nothing. So-called friends are all gone. They're like, dude, we, you know, partying with you was a lot of fun, but now that you're being serious and there's a consequence, uh, we don't want to have any part of that. So his friends leave. Well, he can't afford the things he's been playing with because he's already spent all the money on the loose living and the, the extravagance of taking care of himself. So this young Jewish boy hires himself out to a Gentile, a pagan pig farmer. Now, I don't know if you remember your Bible very well, but pigs were completely unclean. Jewish people didn't raise flocks of pigs. They had sheep, right? It was those pagans, those other people that raised these swine, these pigs that were unclean. In fact, for a Jewish person to touch a pig made them unclean. They had to go through ceremonial, ceremonial washings and everything. So this young boy hits a super low. And by now, he's built up this reputation in town, right? It doesn't take long to get a reputation wherever we're at, does it? I mean, people know what we're doing, right? They may not say anything to us. They may talk behind our back. But if you've ever been in a little town or some place of employment and you're kind of doing this prodigal son thing, everybody in the place knows, right? It's not a secret. So when his son finally hits this rock bottom, here's the interesting thing. He has such a reputation that no one in town will hire him. That's pretty bad. I mean, he has gone way extreme, right? Nobody in town will hire him except for this Gentile pig farmer out in the outskirts of town. And it says that he's gotten to the point so bad, he's so hungry, he's so desperate, that when he finally comes to his senses, he's desiring to eat the stuff that the pigs are eating. Now, anyone ever see what pigs eat? You know, you go out on the farm and they got a big trough and it's a, a slop trough for a reason, right? Because everything you have in the house that's left over, you throw in this bucket and it just all kind of marinates together. All these different flavors and things that nobody else will eat or rotten parts or leftover parts. It's a slop bucket and then you take that out and you dump that in that trough and that pig goes to town on it, right? It's a slop trough. And this young man is so down that he's looking at what he's feeding this pig going, you know, some parts of a slop may be edible. We may be able to find something in there that we can actually eat. That's how desperate he has come. Very interesting paradigm because when he left, he was wealthy, right? He had all his inheritance. He was wealthy. He had everything to provide for himself, to invest, to, to, to use, to make things good, to buy a house, to buy food. He had all this wealth, but now, because of his own decisions, because of being uncontent with his father and squandering everything, thinking he knew better, and well, I deserve this, now he has nothing. He's literally blown his entire life gone. There's nothing. A modern paraphrase for what this young man has done would be this. He simply dug his own grave and now he's about to lie in it. He spent the last couple months in his mind partying and having fun, but really what he's been doing is taking this shovel and digging this six foot grave deeper and deeper. And now that it's dug, it's time to lie in it, 
right? The bill has come. But then we read on. Luke 15, 17 to 22. Happily now, luckily, the story begins to change and turn a little bit to a more positive note. It says, but when he came to his senses, oh, any of you that have had prodigal children, isn't this what you pray for? God, please help them come to their senses. Please help them to get a clue about what they're doing and how they're living their life. Sometimes parents have prayed that prayer for us, haven't they? God, please watch over them. I don't know what they think they're doing, but please help them just to come to a senses. So my take on this is his good father here, we know he doesn't give up on him. And I think part of that is he is constantly interceding with God for his son and praying for him and taking his son and not intervening in his life, but putting his son in God the Father's hands and saying, Lord, he's in your hands. Will you speak to him where I can't? Will you minister to him where I can't? Will you fix him to where I can't? Because he won't even listen to me. And here's where God does the miracle. Here's where we are encouraged for our children to pray for them when they're doing good, but especially when, when they're not and they're struggling, to continue daily to lift them in prayer. He says, so when this young man came to his senses, in other words, in the middle of this pig slop farm, he has this aha, this eureka moment, this metamorphosis that his brain finally clicks on and the blinders are off. And he says, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? I'm dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Please make me as one of your hired servants. So the young man got up and came to his father. Oh, here's where the fun begins. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt rage and anger and frustration for him, right? It's not what it says. It's what most fathers would think, wouldn't it? Dad, come here he comes, he's gonna ask for more money again. Here we go again, right? But this father whose heart was sold out to God his heart was crying and yearning for his son, says, this father, when he saw him, he felt compassion for him. And he ran and he braced him and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight I am no longer worthy to be called your son. So what we see here is a beautiful issue of a change of heart, right? Isn't this what all parents pray for their prodigal children is a change of heart because we know that we cannot change them in fact oftentimes the more we push the change them what do they do they dig their heels in even more and I think that's why this son took off to a distant land so dad couldn't even be around to do that to have any influence whatsoever and we see the cost of squandering all this that he had been freely given when he finally came to the point to realize his father was not the ogre he thought he was. His father was not the mean, restricting man that he thought he was, but that he was truly loving and caring. Interesting thing with that in our spiritual life is there are Christians who think, well, God is just so restricting. He just keeps me from having any fun. And what they don't realize is that God is providing and protecting for them in a way that they don't understand, in a way that keeps them from danger and especially from their own mindset of their own desires and temptations. And they don't realize that. And that's part of the message for you and I today is that wherever you are in life right now, if you're at that point where you're saying, oh, life is just horrible. Life is bad, it's just not fair. Nobody does what I want them to do. I argue with these people all the time. They just, they fail me all the time. Let's get our head out of the sand in that pity poor me party. And let's look and see how God has provided for us. Anybody in here have food? 
this week? Clean water? Anybody in here got more than 10 bucks in your pocket in your bank account or hiding somewhere under your mattress? Maybe loose change in your car? Anybody in here have a house over your head? Anybody in here have a loving church to go to where you're wanted and needed? Then right now, you have more than the majority of the rest of the world. Right now, in spite of how bad you think life is and how tough it is and how you wish it could be so much different, you are so blessed. Anybody in here have a relationship and salvation with Jesus Christ that your eternity is set and Jesus is going to prepare a place for you as we speak? Then what, what is so bad in this life? You see, it's all dependent on the, the, the glasses or the goggles that you look through. Some of us have goggles that are so muddy and dirty and dusty that we can't see anything out of them. And it's just, oh, it's dirty and dusty and muddy and yucky, right? We need a spiritual goggle cleaning. It's kind of what this son went through. It says, when he came to his senses, in other words, when he cleaned his, his rosy colored glasses and realized the world wasn't the way he wanted it to be, but actually the world was a good place where he had been provided for and taken care of and blessed. But he didn't see it until he lost almost everything. I pray that we don't ever get to that point in our life with our heavenly father that we run so far that God just says I I'm going to turn you over turn you over to your own choices because you obviously desire not to be with me you are trying so hard to run away I'm going to let you go in fact you see God doing that in this story because when the son demanded his inheritance he was given it and did, 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 does it say that the dad stopped and begged and pleaded with him not to go? No, the dad let him go. Because the dad knew that unless the son chose to change his mind, and more importantly, change his heart, nothing that the dad ever did would make a squat of difference, right? We can't change people. Only God is big enough to do that. And we're no different. There are times in our lives that until we come to a point where we understand and get it, we don't change either, right? We're all pretty darn good at digging our heels in and standing our ground and being defiant, aren't we? We have to choose to change. We have to come to that place where we, as the prodigal son did, we have to come to our senses, especially in relationship with God our Father. It's interesting, Charles Wadsworth says this. It says, by a time a man realizes that maybe his father was right, he usually has a son who thinks he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> little parody, a little irony there, isn't it? But isn't it so true? By the time you realize, hey, maybe dad wasn't so bad, it's like, <laughs> dad, why does my son hate me? Well, you're carrying on that family lineage that you started when you took away, right? So the son now turns to home. And I guess, as I'm thinking and reading about this story, that when this prodigal son is out, he's lost everything, he knows he's lost it, there's nobody else to blame. He chose it, he did it. He didn't listen, it's all gone. He's out feeding pigs. I think his heart turns back to home and he begins to think about that nice bed that he used to have. And the meals, the, the food just appeared, you know, it was kind of like Star Trek. You push a button, you open a door, and food's there, right? You never have to go looking for it, you don't have to buy it. There's water in the bathroom, you can shower, and soap magically is always there, and a clean towel. And, you know, it's, it's amazing that these new, these new washing machines, when you grow up as a kid, you put your clothes in them, and all of a sudden they come out folded in your room. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Isn't that nice? You know? That's the concept that this son probably starts thinking back that, you know, even admits it, he goes, my dad's hired a servant to even have enough bread to eat. They don't go without. They have a house to stay in. They have food to eat. And my dad provides all of it. And even more for us. And I think he begins to finally get homesick. It's amazing what a little dose of reality will do to change a heart, isn't it? When we finally hit rock bottom and it 
stares us straight in the face of, you know what, you really can't go any deeper. <laughs> you, you can't run away any further. You've, you've gone as far as that rope will allow you to go. And it makes you stop and look around. A little dose of reality does amazing things for a change of heart. I see this reality when we go walking our puppy. The puppy's not trained yet. You ever have a dog that gets on a leash and it's going to take off on its own? The next thing you know, that dog is coughing and gagging and choking, right? Well, a smart dog does something. It realizes, hey, this is not good. The more I pull, the more I choke. Maybe I should back off a little bit, right? And now I'm not choking and gagging anymore. That's the picture here where the sun has been pulling and pulling on this, this leash and has hit the end of it. And his eyes are watered and he's coughing and gagging. And he's like, you know what? This really isn't as fun as I thought it would be. I thought choking and coughing and gagging would be wonderful, but it's kind of painful and it hurts. It's not good. Maybe I should stop and go back. And that's what he does with this change of senses. There's a story of a little teenage girl who got in an argument with her parents. So she did run away from home. And when she got out in the street, she was young and no experience, so she couldn't find any work. And she finally, out of desperation, with all the men out on the street, turned to prostitution. Because she had no place to go, no place to call home at night after her prostitution was done, she had to find a place to sleep. So she would often go to a park or a, a rest stop and find a public restroom and go in a stall and sleep inside that stall. That was her bedroom. It stated that she often thought back to the love of her parents and even though they got in that horrible bad argument that one time how much they did love her and took care of her and some of the good times that she had growing up with the birthday parties and all the fun stuff and she desperately longed to return home. But this little girl in her own mind had wandered so far away that she was self-convincing herself that there was no way she could ever go back. I mean, look what she had done. Look how low she had fallen from her parents' expectations. One night as she walked into a restroom late at night to find a place to sleep, there were flyers hanging all over the bathroom everywhere. All of them had pictures of her parents on it, and all of them had a note that read, Honey, no matter where you are, no matter what you've done, we will always love you. Please come home. That moment, tears began to fall down and stream down her face, but they weren't tears of sadness. They were tears of joy because suddenly she had that coming to her senses aha moment that even though she had failed, her parents still loved her enough to say, honey, come home. We can look beyond this. Doesn't the Bible say that love truly does cover a multitude of sins? And this is where it hits home. Verse 20 back to Luke says that uh, when the son was walking back to the father, probably rehearsing with his head down the things he would say to his dad. It says, but while the son was a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him, and he ran and embraced and kissed him. The beautiful thing about understanding a little Jewish history makes this story even richer, because men didn't run. They had their long robes, and for them to run, they had to tuck that robe up, and it looked ridiculous. So this father was willing to look ridiculous to get his son back. This father was willing to run to his son instead of wait for his son to go through the humiliation of coming all the way back and begging to come home. The father went to meet him. And what this really tells us about the father is this. The dad had been looking out that window every day long, waiting for this figure in the distance to walk up the path to come home. And he knew what that figure looked like.
God, there's a reality with God our Father. He's watching for us to come home. He's watching for us to turn around and come back to Dad. No matter where you've gone, what you've done, how bad it's been, our Father in Heaven is saying, Child, come home. We'll make it right. I love you. For the son, it's interesting that he finally came to his senses. In other words, the interpretation is, is this. He finally came to a point called repentance. Because for us to return home to our Heavenly Father or to return home to our worldly father that we have bailed on, we have to come to a point of repentance. And we all know that means of changing of our ways, right? Well, repentance is more than feeling bad about what we've done or bad about being caught or bad about not having more money to keep going. Repentance is feeling guilty enough that compels us to do something about the situation. And here's the challenging thing with repentance. Until someone comes to the point of repentance, things won't change, will they? They have to come to that intellectual and emotional and spiritual point of saying, I am so overwhelmed by what I've done, I am willing to do something, anything, whatever it takes to change my circumstances. You see, that's what salvation for the Christian is all about. To say, God, I've been running from you and fighting against you all my life. I've been trying to make my own world because I didn't want to be a part of yours. And God, against you and you alone have I sinned. I ask your forgiveness. I ask you to take me as I am. Romans 10, 9 and 10 tell us this, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Did you catch that? You confess with your mouth, but you also believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and that God did raise him from the dead. You will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth one confesses, confession is made unto salvation. But you have to believe. In other words, you have to go back to Dad and say, uh, Dad, I get it now. You were right. That's what salvation is about, and that's what the story of the prodigal son is about. About the son realizing Dad was right all the time, and not limiting him, and not being mean, and not keeping anything from him, but in fact the exact opposite. He was providing everything. We read on at the end of the story. Luke 22 to 32. But when the father sees the son and runs to him, he yells to the slaves, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this son of mine who was dead has come to life again. He was lost and has been found and they began to celebrate. But now the older son was in the field working, and when he came and approached the house, he heard the music and the dancing, and he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring, what are these things and what could this mean? And the servant said to him, your brother has come home, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he received him back safe and sound. But the older brother became angry and was not willing to go in, and his father came out and pleaded with him. But the older son said to the father, Look, for so many years I've been serving you, and I've never neglected a command of yours, and you've never given me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead, and has begun to live, and was lost, and is now found. Now the older brother is a whole other story, but it, actually when you kind of look at it, it's the same attitude, isn't it? Well, gee, Dad, I didn't get this, and he got that. I want more. I should have had this. But that story is for another sermon. But what we read in here is that the father has the son, and it says an interesting thing in verse 32, when the dad's telling the older, older brother about his son coming out, he says, son, your brother has come back and finally has 
begun to live. In other words, this is Dad recognizes this is a whole new life. It's just like salvation. We are a new creation. We have just begun to live. See Barry McCartney, uh, another theologian, who is commentating on all three of the parables in Luke 15, says this, especially about this third parable. He says, God throws a party when one sinner repents. God throws a party when one sinner repents. Now I think of that back in my younger days as a pastor and a youth pastor in an old traditional church and there used to be a little jealousy going on with those young kids because someone would come to salvation and everyone's in an uproar about it and someone's going, well I've been a Christian for 90 years and nobody ever threw me a party. Isn't that the older brother syndrome? It's like you already have salvation. God's already blessed you with everything. Why are you complaining? You've already got it all, it's right here. But we struggle with that jealousy issue, don't we? William Barclay, the theologian, also goes on to state this about the things, the gifts the Father gives the Son, and this is key. He says, in Luke 15, 22, each of the three things the Father mentions has its own significance. The robe stands for honor, and it wasn't just any robe, it was the best robe. In other words, it was not a disgrace to come home, but an honor that the son came home. The ring stands for mastery, and actually the ring was most likely the family signet ring, which meant that this son, when he had that ring, had mastery over the entire household, including all the servants. In other words, dad was re-handing over all of his possessions now that the son had finally begun to live and saying, son, now that you've got a clue, let's put you back in charge and let you master these things. And the shoes, the sandals, were a symbol of status for his son. Because in that time, the servants went without shoes. Only the wealthy family members had foot coverings. So you see what this dad's doing? This dad's lavishing this on his son, which should have been there in the first place. But now the dad realizes his son has come back and has got his senses right. Yeah, he's blown a lot of stuff, but you know what? It's only money. We say that, we kind of cringe, don't we? But reality is we don't take the money with us, do we? What do we look forward to in heaven? The relationships, the people we'll see there. We don't worry about how much of our 401k we're going to have in heaven because it won't make a squat a bit of difference, really, right? Our bank account, nothing. What's important are the relationships we have in heaven. And that's where the dad realizes, my son has come home. For the Jewish people that, or, that Jesus was speaking to, what he was making was a statement of this, the young son, the prodigal son, was symbolic of the Gentiles. That Jesus is saying, uh, we're going to allow them into the kingdom of heaven as well. So this had to be a hard message for them to deal with. But for us, it's also a message of us being the prodigal son, the prodigal daughter. Maybe not against an earthly father, but against our heavenly father. And even after salvation, we have ran away. And we think our dad is just done with us. We need to realize because of this story that Jesus is speaking to us that our Father in heaven is interceding for us and praying for us and watching for us every moment for that one instant where mentally, emotionally, spiritually we come to our senses and we turn around and start walking home. And the beauty is when we come back, Dad throws a party and celebrates because now we have begun to live and we understand what he's provided for us and we have learned to be content because we have more than enough in our Father's kingdom that we'll ever, ever need. And we understand that. For some of us, bringing us home with our own family, it's kind of like this. A little boy frightened by the thunder and lightning storm called out one night. He's like, Daddy, come in, I'm scared. In the middle of the night with the thunder and lightning going off and shining through the dark curtain windows, the father walked in and said, Son, he says, Son, God loves you and he'll take care of you through all this storm. 
Little boy looks up and says, Dad, I know God loves me, but right now I want somebody with skin on. <laughs> Practical application for us this Father's Day is we may have wayward family members. We need to intercede for them. We need to pray for them. We need to be Jesus with skin on for them. And when they come home, welcome them with open arms. Continue to pray for them until they come home. May God bless you as you've heard this story once again. May he speak to you. May he encourage you. And may you and I be content in all that God has provided, knowing that it's more than enough and it's wonderful and not look elsewhere for satisfaction. Let's pray. Father, on this Father's Day, we thank you so much for your tremendous blessings upon our life. We thank you that you love us in spite of ourselves you love us in spite of our wayward decisions and you always welcome us home lord we pray for those individuals out there in the world right now that have gone wayward we pray that they too would come to their senses whether they're our family members or others that they would come to their senses and return home but most importantly that they would return home to salvation in you that they would come back into your loving arms that has never given up on them, that has loved them enough to look past the sin and forgiven them, the desires to be in relationship with them even now. And Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for being such a wonderful, loving, faithful Father. To you be all glory, in Jesus' name.